Emma Segor from LSE London. This year, LSE London is organizing a project series called Housing in London, Addressing the Supply Crisis. It's a knowledge exchange project that aims to bring together stakeholders to improve the debate and the discourse around the supply crisis in London. Our project is arranged around four themes, and one of those is the role of foreign money. For each of our themes, we are organizing a series of workshops and site visits that allow us to discuss the detail and nuance of the various themes. But arguably, uh, uh, the media and others overstate the real problem and underestimate the benefits which can accrue. Now the literature on this is mainly from the industry, it's from estate agents in one form or another. On February 27th, the research team, along with some stakeholders, visited Greenwich Peninsula as a site visit on this theme. But we can take you through the experience of the peninsula through the marketing suite because all the collateral is here. As it's a knowledge exchange project, the aim is to get stakeholders around a common table and discussing what actually can work to overcome barriers to accelerating housing supply in London. We've got two plots, 114 and 115. 114 is this plot which has um, Moat as a social housing provider. It's always great to get on site and to feel the, the scale of this sort of scheme. It was really about chatting with the guys at Night Dragon and, um, and understanding their commitment to placemaking. It's not just about delivering a number of homes as quickly as possible. Clearly that is one priority because they want the, you know, the quicker you can deliver the homes, the quicker the place becomes a real place. But I was quite taken aback by how, much, how committed they are to doing things well. <laughs> and, uh, and you know they're already underway and they've got the firm program and they want to expand and improve on, uh, on that because some of that was an inherited master plan from the previous developers which again I think is really encouraging and if we can get an extra 5,000 homes on that master plan then that's great news for London too. Londoners are seeing everywhere in central London and beginning to be outside central London very large sites being developed uh, often with very high-rise buildings. This is pretty new for Britain and it is being organised ultimately with the help of international money. International money kept building going in London during the after the recession, uh, but in the last three or four years we are seeing a new style of development uh, which is bringing in not just international money but also international expertise in management and in logistics. And Greenwich Peninsula is an example of that. Some people are calling it Hong Kong on Thames, but it has got a very different way of accelerating development. I do think that international developers do play an important role in bringing, uh, bringing forward housing much more quickly and speeding up that delivery. So they have the appetite for risk and they have the funding available. And they, have, they work with very different sort of funding structures and they also have a lower cost of the initial capital so it enables them to, to give that, uh, that to, to get involved in big schemes sort of early on. And, um, and one of the things that we have seen is that a number of these um, sort of foreign investors or developers have been quite interested in the large scale developments and it's the regeneration sites that have been, you know, maybe UK developers have been quite put off um, from them over the last few years, they've been quite problematic sites and you see the, uh, the overseas money has a lot more appetite for risk for that sort of thing. There are some issues that limit the potential of foreign developers in the London market. The first is the overwhelmingly negative perception of foreign buyers generally. There's a feeling that investors buy flats and leave them empty, that they drive up prices, that they make things more difficult for normal Londoners. 
Um, the political environment is um, potentially problematic for international developers. As a negative connotation, I think if you do target sort of overseas buyers, investors who have been buying the end product, I think that will feed through, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll see that as a very negative message um, to be sending out. There's one other thing is about the changing taxation. I think that is also quite detrimental to, it, it, it puts them off, it's the uncertainty around any changes in taxation and Hong Kong and Singapore have seen a whole raft of changes happen in their home markets and, uh, and, and, and you know that's one of the reasons why they're also very keen to buy over here or to develop over here is because it's a lot easier for them. We've already seen a number of the changes but there's actually quite a few which are specifically targeting or being mooted to target overseas buyers and I think that's, um, that's quite sort of politically sensitive as well. Second, foreign institutions or governments who are thinking of investing in the UK market can be put off by the fact that British institutions don't seem to be so keen and they wonder if there's something behind that that they don't know. Third, the British planning system relies on negotiation between the planning authority and the developer for things like provision of affordable housing, infrastructure, schools, health centers, and so on. And this fundamental element of British planning is unfamiliar in many societies where the planning system is much more rigid and certain. And so it can be difficult for foreign investors to make a judgment about how much risk they're taking on when they invest in the UK. UK developers, of course, the flexibility in the planning is a positive thing, but actually I, I get the feeling that some Asian developers would probably quite like to just be told it's 35% uh, you know, affordable and that's what it will be across all of the sites in London. Um, or you know, they see that there's one scheme that's managed to get away with just 10% and they say, I want to do it like that. And you, know, you can't give that sort of assurance. So I think um, complexity around that and lack of clarity around that is a, a, an obstacle. I think also the timings, um, the time of, of planning itself, but also the time of construction. They're used to working on very big, you know, large scale developments which they can run incredibly quickly and efficiently and actually to bring that over here, it doesn't quite work in the same way. So I think they maybe get a bit frustrated by the speed of construction and the speed it takes for planning as well. Finally, while these new high-rise developments do include a proportion of affordable housing, like all new developments in London, and that can go up to 20 or even 30 percent of the units, most of them are not what we'd call affordable for low-income families or even for middle-income families. The majority of the units are luxury products. And while it's a good thing that more housing is coming to London, on the whole, this is at the top end of the market. The visit was a chance for a group of stakeholders, a diverse group of stakeholders, which include um, an MP, researchers, housing policy analysts, to go out in London and see these themes illustrated on the ground. What we've definitely seen on this project is that the housing crisis and all issues around housing are incredibly complex. However, the debate and the discourse around it can often be very oversimplified, particularly concerning the role of foreign money or of international investment. The focus is often on international demand solely. Our project seeks to look at how to accelerate supply, and therefore this site visit and the workshop on this theme were a great chance to look at the other side of that coin in a way, and look at how international money can be actually a, a way to stimulate new development and increase the number of housing units in London.